Hello everyone. Sorry for being absent for so long. Again. Well, you know me, I can be absent for several months. I'm terribly sorry about that, and if I could, I would post a new video like every two weeks or something like that, but we have what we have. Anyway, thank you all for your patience. This time everything will be a little bit different. This time several episodes will be dedicated to one game and will be performed in sort of a podcast. I've read some comments that a lot of people asked about the Evil Within video or videos. The main reason for that was the fact that a lot of reviewers and players in general adore this game. And even the main director of the new God of War said that The Evil Within is one of his favorite games. Besides, the game was directed by Shinji Mikami, the main director and consultant of the most Resident Evil games. And when I heard about this game for the first time, it was something really promising. Speaking about my experience with this game, well, I've had extremely unstable relationships with it. I'm going to tell you about it in this video. I have extremely controversial emotions about it and in these videos I'll try to describe them to you in details. I should warn you, this video will probably be a little bit too emotional, so bad jokes, swearing and anger will probably be present. Let's have a small talk about the evil within. Let's start from the beginning. I love horror games. Seriously. I mean it. And when I saw the first trailer of this game, I was really excited. It looked really interesting, fresh, with great visuals and style. In spite of the fact that there are not too many good horror games nowadays, and there were even less of them in 2013. I've played this game several times. I tried to play it like four times at first and now I understand that there was a reason for that. You should understand one thing. Everything I would like to tell you about this game is that it is gorgeous, innovative, original, beautiful. Everything works perfectly well and it reanimates the half-forgotten genre. I would really like to tell you how much was I impressed by the story, how much I was devoured by its plot and characters, how interesting it was to find out more and more about this world piece by piece. How intriguing it was to find more information about it and watch dozens of videos about its plot and lore. I would like to tell you how perfectly well all these aspects work together mechanically, how polished the controls, balance and optimization are. And to tell you how happy I am that I've witnessed this game. Everything I would like to do is to tell you how amazing this game is. That this game didn't blindly follow the trends and was filled by dozens of different mechanics and astonishing situations. That every piece is at its place and nothing can be removed from this complex genius creation or added without harming it. And that's all I would like to do. But we can't always get what we want, right? The Evil Within was released in 2014. The game was directed by Shinji Mikami, developed by Tango Gameworks and published by Bethesda Softworks. Well, you know, Shinji Mikami Resident Evil 4, Vanquish, God Hand and all that stuff. So even before the actual release, this game received a certain hype and support. You know, Shinji Mikami is working on another horror game. And not like those horror games like Outlast where you have to run away all the time and hide somewhere. Don't get me wrong, the first Outlast was outstanding, but there were, and still are, too many followers of that conception. Besides, under the wing of Bethesda, one of the biggest AAA companies in the world, which means unlimited amount of money and freedom of creation. Right from the beginning, The Evil Within demonstrates its determination to become the horror game everything will remember and look upon for a very long time. All that blood, visuals, gore, style, brains and all that stuff was shown in trailers. Zombies, references to the shining, mysterious lighthouse, different locations. And all that is a survival horror. The game from the master of the genre, from one of the most famous publishers. So what could go wrong? To tell you the truth, I somehow missed the release of this game, because of some reasons I can't remember right now, but saw a lot of great, good or at least decent reviews about this game. I kept in mind that someday I'll spend several hours playing this game and these hours would be awesome. But when I actually bought this game, I paid attention to some negative reviews as well. And it was really strange to read that because I opened the Steam page of this game and see thousands of positive reviews, amazing screenshots, trailers show cool stealth gameplay. The description says highly crafted environments, horrifying anxiety, immersive world and all that. I've read all the text in this game. I've listened to all audiologues. 
I've examined the plot and lore as hard as I could. Wikipedia, lore analysis, videos, articles, believe me, I know this game. And I hate it. With passion. Well, maybe the word hate doesn't fit here. Better to say I despise it. It's not only because it's bad, and oh, be sure we'll talk about this game. This game is the incarnation of everything bad in horror games in general, and it causes only frustration and disappointment. Well, probably most of you think that I'm overreacting now. Probably most of you played this game and even liked it, and hey, I can accept that. I mean, I have some emotional reflex on this game, but I can't remember any game in my gaming experience that could enrage me so much like The Evil Within did. Everything I'll say in this series is my opinion and my opinion only. You may agree or disagree, that's your right. And I'm honestly happy for you if you like this game, seriously. But if you're already too skeptical and disagree with my words in advance, please just hear me out, okay? In this series of videos, we'll visit every damn level of this game. We'll talk about every type of enemies, every weapon, and every game mechanic this game has to offer. When we finish this series, you will know every possible detail about this game, besides some really small details and obvious things. Like, look at the wall, it's red, or something like that. So I have to warn you right now, huge and major spoilers alert! If you still haven't played this game and want to do that, turn off this video and come back when you finish it. Now if everyone is ready, let's get started! The game starts with a cutscene when we see the main character Sebastian, a driver, some woman and Markiplier heading to investigate a crime scene. At the Beacon Memory Hospital they find a massacre. At this point we can see that the game tries to look like a movie. The very first thing that I disliked in this game is these black lines. A lot of people thought that it was a good idea, but they took their words back when they actually started playing this game. I understand the attempts to make this game look like a movie, but come on, it's a survival horror game. And almost half of the screen is not used? How is that? Luckily for every player, after some time, the patch was released that allowed players switch between cinematic experience and... let's call it rational experience. This way or another, you cannot take away the fact that the game has its own vision and stylistic design. And this can be related to the most parts of this game. But the engine that the game uses does some great job in ruining the immersion through uploading textures on the fly. ID Tech 5, that was also used in Wolfenstein The New Order, is responsible for this. I understand that all those uploads is more like the fault of the engine than the game itself, but I just had to mention it. But let's get back to style and locations. I've already mentioned that there are dozens of them. The city, sewers, churches, village, hospital, my room after a party, etc. All locations are visually great and filled with atmosphere and details. It's a great pleasure to examine them, really. But I have to point out that I'm talking only about visual component here, not level design or something like that. First of all, we're driving through the streets during the day with no people for some reason. But suddenly the radio starts to play some trash and everyone feels sick. God damn it. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. And after that... Oh, oh, beg your pardon. Hello? No, I'm, I'm making a video. The Evil Within. Wait, what? No, no, the first one. What do you mean there was a sequel released? Fuuu- I should note that we won't be talking about the second part, because at first this game was supposed to be a standalone project with a complete story. I'll mention the second part only once or twice. We arrive to the destination point and see how close Sebastian is with his colleagues. Maybe even... too close. I mean, this is the very beginning of the game and such a thing happens, just, just saying. Uh, because the beginning of any game is usually kind of very important segment to catch players' attention. Well, my attention was definitely caught after this moment. But pff, don't worry, I remember that this game was published by Bethesda, and if I start discussing every bug in this game, this video will last for two years. I just want to remind you to watch at least this video to the very end. Just keep your dislikes for now, okay? We enter the hospital and see a lot of dead people. But don't worry, I'm a detective, I'm here to crack the case! We enter a security room in order to check some records. We see that assassin guy in a white hood who kills everyone he sees. After that he sticks a nail into Sebastian's eye and we wake up in a completely different place. What the hell?
We're hanging upside down among dead bodies and see some kind of a butcher with a chainsaw who cuts these bodies to pieces. I can't explain to you why we are still alive and there's a huge knife in front of us, but hey, if you're a butcher who cuts human bodies, you just have to make sure you keep one person alive and leave a huge knife in front of his face so this person could escape. We have to steal the key from the sadist, it's his official name, and open the door. The whole level itself is good actually, I have no problems with it. On this level players learn how to move and interact with objects, players are taught how to hide, the game shows very decent atmosphere. We have to distract the sadist by throwing bottles and sneak behind and this episode definitely possesses tension. The only problem here is that the rooms are small and give no alternative ways to complete the level. I mean in 90% of cases we'll go here, throw a bottle there, run through that door and for most of the players that's the only way to pass the segment. And that's okay, that's the first level. But I hope that the game will expand the locations or show something new in this concept. The game lasts for about 16 hours, I do hope it will develop its concepts. The sadist chases us and injures our leg, but instead of performing one single attack and finishing this game, he closes Sebastian in a room with sharp spinners. And that's really dumb of him, because blades are made from air, and we don't die if we touch them. Besides that, they stop in the very last moment. That's the most stupid trap I've ever seen in my life, guys. And besides that, there is a way to the sewers here. The sadists literally let us go for some unknown reason. We didn't have the slightest chance to die in this room. Okay, whatever. What really bothers me is that injury on the leg. I hope I won't fall into some kind of pool with old blood, corpses and rust. Sebastian can get an infection. Whoa! The sadist catches up and somehow, on one leg, we manage to escape the sadist, who has two healthy legs, by the way. Sebastian enters the elevator and oh miracle, our leg has healed, no scratches, no blood, and not only leg, the clothes have mended as well. That's how hospitals should work. Yeah, no wonders that all victims in the lobby had perfectly fine clothes. We escape the hospital, enter the ambulance, and some unknown trash is happening to us. Looks like inception, the road is breaking, everything's moving, buildings are falling. But the characters do not react to this in any way. You know, they're just driving and behaving like they're all tough and they see that shit every day. No emotions like, oh my god, what the hell is that? What's happening? Do you see that? Why are you so calm, you sick bastard? No, all characters in this game can express only two emotions. Either... What is going on here? Or... And that's it. Seriously, besides some rare exceptions. And that's one of the main problems. Not only the characters are empty, they extensively suck out the immersion and joy of playing with their hollowness. Even despite the fact that all the characters are cliché, the main character is a gloomy detective who has problems with alcohol, his partner is a very smart Asian guy who behaves strictly according to the textbooks, and the main antagonist who's been a genius since his childhood but who got hurt by dumb farmers and he's evil now. Don't get me wrong, cliché itself is not bad. Cliché is something recognizable and something that people got used to. It's something that's been tested for ages and most of the people are not against it. A well-used cliché can make anything better. And nowadays, it's impossible to create a story without a single cliché. These archetypes are so beaten up, so boring and dull. And now these archetypes can be met mostly in parodies, but the evil within is anything else but parody. The game takes itself very seriously, and because of that some moments look even funnier. But cliché is just half of the problem, because even the most primitive stereotypes can become interesting if you put them in some unusual and extraordinary situations. And The Evil Within definitely has some extraordinary situations and circumstances, but unfortunately this game does not understand why games, especially horror games, require characters. I mean real characters, not dolls. So the main heroes, with minor exceptions, do not say or act with passion, joy or at least interest. They do not react to anything that's happening around them and behave mostly like skeletons for characters. Like some dialogues are supposed to be there. They were intended to be there, but someone forgot to write these dialogues into the scenario. The world literally changes in front of Sebastian's eyes. There are things happening that he couldn't even imagine. And what's his reaction? Shit. I 
could really blame voice acting, but this would be totally unfair to do because there is simply nothing to work here with. There are no real dialogues in this game. Whole hours can pass by without any spoken word in this game. Characters, I mean real characters, for any game, movie or book are extremely important, especially for a horror story. This is one of the pillars the story and experience stands on, because the character is someone we're concerned about, someone we cheer for, someone we sympathize with. The adventure of this character should become our adventure, and in order to do that we should get at least some kind of emotional connection with this character. And it's not possible to do so if you cannot recognize a real person, a human being in this character. And in order to make this or that character look like a human being, it requires some personal qualities and attributes. If a certain character on the screen does not feel fear, anxiety, concern or emotions in general, how are viewers or players supposed to do that instead of the character they see? This is such a basic thing. Scenarios for Dummies page 4, seriously. I cannot understand, I refuse to understand how this moment was fucked up so much. Because in old cult favorite horror games, characters could feel horror, joy, doubt, sadness, despair, anger, hope, all spectra of emotions. Not only the main character is supposed to feel all that, but someone we cheer for and concerned about. This way players are able to understand that this or that universe is at least real for the heroes, and we get into the game. But not here. Not only Sebastian does not react to the actions that are happening around him, but he behaves like something like that was supposed to happen. I mean seriously, when I played this game for the first time, I was completely sure that Sebastian was aware of all that, and that maybe he did something horrible in the past that's led to these consequences. Because he's so calm, he knows where to go and how to behave, and he accepts these consequences, trying to overcome them. Besides, Sebastian is not a tough guy. Because if you read his diaries, you'll be able to find out about his dark past, about how he lost his daughter in the fire, and then his wife, and all that could mean something if he at least mentioned those serious or unfortunate events for once. Or if the game itself focused on these events, for instance. Not a single phrase of any dialogue in this game hints or gives the slightest bit of information about Sebastian's past. So why are these backstories in the game again? What are they doing here? Anyway, we'll definitely be discussing the plot of this game later. But the point is, characters in this game suck hard. All heroes fall from a cliff and still alive for some reason. And our main hero wakes up in a completely different place, in a hospital with an apathetic nurse. This is our hub where we can save, read some notes and do some other stuff we'll talk about a bit later. And again, Sebastian doesn't react or comment this in any way. He was in the ambulance car a couple of minutes ago, and now he's in a hospital of some sort. Then he found himself in the ambulance car again. Now the real gameplay starts, and right here we're able to notice the first symptoms of sickness of this game. You see, this segment slightly reminds the first hours of Resident Evil 4. I mean, a village with zombies. Here we notice Connolly. He was a driver in the ambulance car, but we see how he's been captured by carnage and turned into a zombie. Unfortunately, we have to kill him. What a shame. What a pity, right, Sebastian? No? Well, okay. These zombies are rather slow and awkward, but if they catch you, they'll tear your face away. And you don't want to encounter more than one zombie at a time. So the game wants us to use stealth. Hide in the shadows, perform stealth kills, and save the bullets. Sounds good? Sounds good. The problem is that nothing in this game is done in a way to use stealth efficiently. The Evil Within doesn't possess the instruments and options every more or less decent stealth game has to perform these mechanics. First of all, our main helper in the situation of stealth is information advantage. We know where the enemy is and the enemy doesn't know where we are. And these are rules of the game that help us remain in the stealth mode. What else? 
Good controls and responsive camera. I solemnly inform you that all these elements are completely broken. Sebastian is controlled so awkwardly, the input lag feels so long and it will set you up dozens of times. Especially awkwardly it feels when you try to control Sebastian while sitting, because the camera tries to predict your way of moving and thinking in order to show you an appropriate angle of vision, but in half of the cases it does it wrong. You fight with camera in this game too many times. Yes, it rarely kills you, but definitely pisses you off. Too often you have to perform two or three extra moves in order to show the camera where you want to see. And this is something I want you to keep in mind all the time. When I'm describing other flaws of this game in terms of gameplay, you should always keep in mind that both camera and controls suck in this game hard. Really hard. And it doesn't become better. This influences the whole experience in general. You'll never get rid of it, deal with it. Maybe you can get used to it, but this is extremely personal. We cannot brace against the walls, we cannot look around the corners, we cannot say for sure if enemies see us or not, because the stealth indicator is active only on easy difficulty. The animation of enemies is extremely jumpy and controversial. Even if our enemy is in our field of vision, you can't say for sure whether he's simply patrolling or he's noticed us and going our way. Stealth kills are also awkward and the animation lasts for 3 years. Besides while well, stealth killing, the game indicates us as standing and not sitting, which means that all enemies around can notice us even if we kill someone in stealth, and everything we'll have to do is to run. But we can't run in this game! Because stamina meter in this game... Okay, it's time to talk about stamina meter in this game, and talk about why it's so freaking awful! I honestly don't like stamina meters in games, except Dark Souls or Bloodborne for example, because the mechanics itself is different. Sometimes these stamina meters work fine, but as a rule they just annoy. The most vivid example in my opinion is Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness. The game developers think that to limit possibilities of a player to perform some actions, sprint for example, is a good idea. To create a challenge, they say. Technically it works, but at the same time it usually limits the joy about the process. I swear to you guys, I haven't seen stamina meter worse than in this game. You see Sebastian Castellanos, a hardcore detective. A well-trained police officer, with a fine body and decent physical form, is able to run for 3 seconds. I mean, we can sprint for 5 seconds, but he slows down on the 3rd second. And it's not even the worst! These animations! Animations in this game is a source of great number of problems. As I've already mentioned, Sebastian slows down on the 3rd second, but when stamina meter runs out, Sebastian stops completely to catch his breath for five damn seconds. How do you think? Is it too long in a stealth game? Well, yeah, it's a ridiculous amount of time. Every zombie in this game can kill you with full HP within this period. Who decided that that was a good idea? Even a two-year-old child from beyond the sleep can run longer and faster than Sebastian Castellanos. And plus he dies from asthma every time the stamina meter runs out. You might say that this was done for a challenge, otherwise players would simply sprint through locations. But there are dozens of ways to make this mechanic smarter and natural. For example, when stamina meter runs out, Sebastian can still run, but slower. You can build levels around endless stamina. You can create fast zombies, so sprints would not help to fight them. There is a plethora of ways to go around this, really. Of course you can upgrade his stamina meter, of course you can. But it doesn't work the way it should. Here's the thing. You can upgrade your abilities in this game. You can perform this in your hub. You sit in the electric chair, it hits you with electricity and somehow it gives you the ability to run one second longer. It reminds me of Hitman Absolution where he could run 2 or 4% faster. Wow. Why is it here? Why should I waste my time and resources to evolve Sebastian from a form of a one-year-old child in terms of running into a form of some alcohol addict neighbor who can't even walk the straight line seriously? And how does this help improve player's experience? Do you know what else you can upgrade here? Damage of guns? Critical damage? Yep, critical damage in a survival horror game. And do you know what you cannot upgrade here? Absolutely nothing that concerns stealth in this game. Not a single upgrade gives us some unique vision, a way to mark or track down enemies, hide better in the dark. But we can upgrade a unique skill to carry more than 10 bullets in this game. 10 bullets in this game, that's ridiculous, I can't carry more than 10 bullets at a time? 
And also this game has matches. I, I, I'll explain that role here a bit later, but now you should keep in mind that they exist in this game. And these are not some special huge matches, no, just ordinary matches. You can buy a pack of matches with like 50 matches in the box. And do you know how many matches Sebastian is able to carry in this game without upgrading this parameter? <laughs> Five. Five matches at a time. I'm able to carry a sniper rifle, revolver, magnum, Kojima size crossbow with two bolts of five types, which is ten bolts without a single upgrade, shotgun, healing syringes, grenades, and endless number of jars with cucumbers. But there is no room in the endless ass of Castianos for more than five matches? He has to be hit by electricity in his brain to learn how to carry more than five matches! <laughs> I'm completely shocked that someone takes this game seriously, I mean it. It means that Tango Studio didn't actually care about immersion in this game. Like they just delineated some general concepts and when the time came to count balance for all this, there was not a single person who could stand up and shout out, Wait a second, this is so freaking dumb. Why matches exactly? Why not something more massive or reasonable? We had such mechanics in Silent Hill 4 for example. Do you remember those immortal ghosts? You couldn't kill them, but neutralize them with special swords. The number of swords was much less than the number of ghosts in that game, so you had to think carefully how to use them. Besides, each sword occupied a single slot in the inventory because of its size. It wasn't the coolest business in this game, but at least I could believe that conception. And here only 5 freaking matches. How am I supposed to play this game like that? This is only the beginning of the second level, there are 16 of them here. These matches is a pretty valuable source here, especially in the beginning. The majority of enemies is some kind of zombie. Well, you've probably seen zombie movies or TV shows and there are always some typical zombies and some extremely deformed zombies, like zombies who don't have a half of their heads or have a pipe instead of an eye. In this game all zombies are like that in terms of design. So there are several ways to kill a zombie here. You can shoot their head, stealth kill, allure them to a trap, we'll talk about them soon, or make them fall and burn them down with a match. Which is not bad, should I use a match and save bullets. Besides, if there are enemies nearby, they may fire up as well. The problem is, well, you know, this is kind of a game that for every well done thing, it has two or three completely broken ones. Besides the limit of 5 matches before upgrade, the animation of throwing a match, just like many other animations in this game, is completely inconvenient and long. Any other person in a situation like this would throw a match at a zombie and instantly run away to a safe place or something like this. This action shouldn't take long. But it takes about 3 seconds to perform this action, we cannot cancel for some reason. And we're not immortal at this moment, I mean every fart here can interrupt and damage us, so every animation of any enemy has absolute priority over our actions, except stealth kills. I hope you see the problem. I mean, game tells us, hey, you can set a fire corpse and an enemy near it, two enemies for a price of one. But if your timing is half of a second wrong, and you didn't notice an enemy that's standing to your left because camera in this game sucks, you've received damage because you started the animation and stunned yourself. Now it's time to have a small talk about traps in this game. There are different types of traps like tripwires, steel traps and bombs. Almost all bombs work in a similar way. We reach a trap within a damage area, it starts to beep, after a couple of seconds explodes and deals a huge amount of damage. We have various ways to solve this problem. We can walk around this trap or neutralize it. We can do this if we sit down, slowly reach a trap and push the necessary button. After that, a short quick time event happens. If performed right, we can neutralize the bomb and get some resources to craft a bolt. Besides, I'm still not sure how these bombs work and what they actually react to. My main problem is this minigame that is completely based on player's reaction. As soon as we press the button of interaction with a bomb, this minigame starts instantly. The arrow starts moving. We don't have a chance to get ready for this event, and that save zone is different every time. Even the width of this save zone can be different. Besides, the arrow can perform only one turnover, so almost every attempt to neutralize a bomb can be lethal. Plus, every bomb you see slightly changes from time to time, even if you try to neutralize the same bomb, but using different saves. And again, why is it performed in such a way? I mean, Sebastian sees the bomb in details. Why isn't it shown to a player? Yes, we can see the bomb when we're reaching it. The small clock fades over there. 
But why can't the game show us the bump up close and give us the time to get ready for the action? Why was it so hard to use a cover for the clock phase, for example? So players could see the bump for the first time and have a chance to get ready for the quick time event. This is not the biggest problem in this game, but still it shows the attitude. This game loves to take away control. And it does it on every possible occasion. You would like to perform an action? Okay, 4 seconds without input, please. You would like to perform a stealth kill? Okay, 4 or 5 seconds of animation where you can't move but your enemies can. You would like to get a good story and the feeling that you've accomplished something? <laughs> you have no idea. By the way, even mechanics of firing up your enemies doesn't work the way it should. Enemies that are literally on the corpse do fire up as well, but enemies who go through the flame or stand next to the fire don't. The main method of killing your enemies is to shoot them using your revolver, and at first it's rather weak, so there is a high chance that by the end of the first level you won't have any bullets. And honestly it's not bad. I mean this level was obviously crafted and designed to pass it by using stealth mechanics. There are enough places to hide, strategically catch moments to execute your enemies. Yes, stealth in this game is completely broken, but believe me, this element is the least broken thing of all. At least stealth gives you some emotions of anxiety here, and I can appreciate that. But sometime you'll probably have enough bullets to rush this level through, I promise you. Because all those minor and major flaws of stealth system will bore you pretty fast and do not worth it. I should also mention that there are axes you can perform a one-shot kill with, but they break after the kill and you cannot carry them in your inventory for some reason. I mean, I understand the reason to do that. The fact that these axes break after a single kill is done for balance. You shouldn't give players a chance to carry a weapon that can kill almost anyone with a single swing, I get that. But again, this is just another example how Tango Gameworks puts all those numbers in balance above all immersion and reasonability. I mean, I'm able to carry more than one axe in real life, and when I see a person who is clearly more capable of doing such a thing, I start to ask questions. Slightly later we find Dr. Marcelo Jimenez. We saw him in the intro and at this point have no idea who he is and what he's doing here. He offers to turn into a bait for zombies, so well, okay, why the hell not? We pass through some trivial zombies and find the first obstacle. A huge yourself gate! Great. There's got to be something that'll get through this. Maybe a chainsaw or something. Chainsaw. You probably know that the name for this tool was not made up because it was able to cut huge and thick chains, right? Chainsaws were made to cut trees, otherwise they will become blunt. Well, whatever, who gives a shit? We need to find a way to open these gates, and after wandering around we're able to find Agony Crossbow. That looks both cool and ridiculous at the same time. This weapon looks like some, you know, Japanese design and all that. Like a huge walking robot that looks cool and at the same time you realize that it's impractical, the price to create such a machine is too high, but whatever, it's just a huge walking robot and it looks cool. And this crossbow shoots some harpoons for whale hunting or something like that. They're called bolts here, by the way. There are different kinds of bolts, harpoon bolts, explosive bolts, freezing bolts, um, fla flash bolts, shocking bolts. Again, what's the genre of this game? A survival horror, huh? Cause I've just found a weapon that can shoot shocking bolts. Many people say that this is a survival horror, and this game is a survival horror, partly. I would expect some resources management from a survival horror game than, you know, shooting lightnings. I totally understand that this is a subjective judgment. But we'll talk about the actual genre of this game a bit later. Besides coming back to art direction again, don't you think that this weapon here is slightly out of place? And because of that it looks like a lack of taste that attempts to create something original. Besides the fact that there are monsters here and the world changes before our eyes and we can't carry more than 5 matches, in terms of the setting, Everything seems real. Let's just take a look at our arsenal in this game and check whether it sounds fine or not. A handgun, a magnum, a sniper rifle, a shotgun, grenades, a freaking crossbow that shoots electricity. Well, I don't know, sounds like something is odd here if you ask me. But of course we can't open the gates with our crossbow or handgun, but there is a sadist from the first level with a conveniently placed chainsaw near him. Why is he in this village exactly, by the way? 
This is kind of the first boss in the game and you really want to clear the whole level before fighting him. When you start fighting him, all zombies around run to help him. And this is clearly more of a pain in the ass than this fight deserves. Some bosses in this game have some trick or weakness, but this one clearly doesn't have it. You just run around and throw at him everything you have and pray you have enough things to throw. After that we grab his chainsaw and open the gates. And of course Sebastian will not take the chainsaw with him. What? A chainsaw at the time of a zombie apocalypse? Nah, I clearly don't need it. Okay, maybe it's become blunt, but so whatever. Sebastian meets Jimenez and together we head to his brother's house. This level more or less looks like the previous one, but there are clearly more closed locations here. Also we find Leslie. Oh, I haven't told you about Leslie, have I? Leslie is also one of the heroes here. And all we know about him for now is that he knows Jimenez and Leslie is his patient. Besides, Jimenez needs this boy for some unknown reason. The plot is somehow tied to this guy, but we don't know how for now. Also, when this guy screams, the world around us starts to vibrate, crash, change and all that. Leslie here is not a character, he's more like a function, one of the instruments to move the plot forward. The game decides that this is a perfect time to show us a new type of enemy. And the introduction is bad. If you haven't played this game, just try to guess what exactly will go through this door. An armored zombie? Maybe a big zombie? Some zombie that moves on the ceiling? No, an invisible zombie! And that's surprising for me because I thought that the industry has developed enough to show invisible creatures to players properly. Because such enemies in this kind of game hit below the belt. Because players don't have a chance to track down such enemies in the scene. I mean players didn't have any idea that something like this could happen. This is literally the second type of enemies we've seen in this game. We were not even close to the knowledge that such enemies exist. Another problem is the presentation itself, because there is a very poor work in communication of the game with a player. Let's just analyze it. Sebastian says, I think something's coming. The only enemies we've seen up until now are ordinary zombies and sadists. We don't have a clue that some of them differ from each other aside their visual component. The camera forcefully shows us the opening door, the only source of movement in this part of the room. And because of that all attention is focused on the door. I don't know how paranoid a player should be to jump to the conclusion, oh no the door has opened, must be an invisible zombie! And starts shooting in the air keeping in mind how well the game has taught us to save bullets. Because the only telegraph is the door. At first I thought that there was supposed to come out some huge and extremely slow zombie. I wonder if it has a head and where it is situated exactly. Is it protected or something like that? Only closer to the end I saw some distortions near me but it was a little too late. And this introduction is very strange because slightly later we'll have another scene where these invisible dudes will be trying to attack us. And in this scene they're telegraphed much better. The beds are moving, we see some movement in the puddles, classic signs of an invisible creature. I completely do not understand why these scenes are placed in this order exactly, not vice versa. After that Rubik appears, the main antagonist. He's shown here to reproach Philoluk at a shoddy work of a sound designer in this moment. We must be collectively losing our minds. Losing our minds? Losing our minds? Losing our minds! Losing our minds! Losing our minds! And then gracefully leaves the scene. If you're listening to this video and not watching it, I want you to pay attention here right now. Take a look at the video, some important things are about to happen. We try to follow Ruvik, but suddenly the world reverberates and Sebastian discovers himself in an empty corridor. The world reverberates again and we're flushed out by the reference to The Shining. Screen becomes black and we're in a completely different place which has no connection with the place we were in 5 seconds ago. Sebastian didn't lose consciousness, he wasn't dragged away by someone. We just blinked once, blinked twice. And that's it. By the will of developers, we're in a completely different location. I have a question for you. Did you find it innovative, interesting, original and all that stuff? What, what, what me? Absolutely not. Because such a thing pisses me off even in some Silent Hill games. And I personally find it cheap and boring. 
Personally, I think that teleporting someone from one location to another without any reason, any context and any explanation is a very lame excuse for a scriptwriter. So he or she doesn't have to explain how Sebastian is moved from a village to catacombs, from the sewers to hospital, then to a church house, etc. And a game designer doesn't have to think through a complete world with entrances and exits. No, this approach is for retards, we can simply do the laziest thing in the universe and throw our heroes from one location to another, and players don't have the right to be angry about this, because we have an excuse for such actions that will be revealed 12 hours later. By the way, there is a reason why I ask you to pay attention to this scene. Just keep this scene in mind, please. Because this transition between locations is the only way the game knows. And this is bad. Very bad. Because of that, we have no idea where we are. Why we're here. How long we'll be here. What's next is about to happen. Where should we go and why we should go there. The feeling of misunderstanding will be next to you through the whole game. And there is nothing good about that. It's similar to the feeling when you start a game, then drop it for several months and turn it on again. And you don't remember a thing. Why are we here again? What are we doing here? I remember that I saw some guy who looked evil and we have to stop him from doing something, but what are we doing in this specific room with corpses again? I have this feeling here all the time and you don't even have to drop the game. The structure of narration itself creates and supports this feeling. I'm not exaggerating right now, we'll talk about the plot later, I've already told you, but Sebastian with his company never, in any given period of time in this game, have a distinct and clear goal. Not the slightest idea what they are doing and trying to achieve. Not any kind of plan, even a bad one. Literally, I mean literally, 100% of this game consists of wow, we're in this room and now we're in another room. Well, let's try to go a bit forward and whoop, we're in a completely different room now. The sense of progress is totally the victim here. Take the Lord of the Rings as an example. Here's the ring, bring it to Mordor. Everything that's happening in this story is dedicated to one specific goal, one way or another. Are we closer to Mordor than before? Good. Does something stand on our way to Mordor? Bad. That's simple and perfect. Here, we're always God knows where, have no idea what to do and where to go. When the location changes, we have no idea whether we're closer or farther from our destination. We don't even understand where the destination is, damn it. All we try to do is not to die here. The structure of this game is so idiotic, you can simply take all the levels, randomly shuffle them and nothing will change. And I would deal with that if the game could show us some interesting locations this way, but no, the game doesn't do that. Besides, it influences the pacing, because these transitions separate our heroes. Every time we find someone from our team, you can be sure that 15 minutes later, you'll be forcefully separated again. This level is a small arena we try to get out, but Ruvik doesn't let us to do it until we kill all zombies here. During my first walkthrough, I was really pissed off by this level. But during my second walkthrough, it was much easier, because I learned to establish priorities properly. You see, when you see the upgrading tree out of context for the first time, you are still under the illusion that this game is a survival horror. In this case, what is more reasonable to upgrade in this situation? Well, health, right? Sprint in order to move faster, stock to carry more things with you. This is all bullshit. Do you know the most valuable upgrades here? General damage and critical damage for every weapon. So as soon as you completely upgrade your main handgun, you'll be able one-shot almost every ordinary zombie here. If you completely upgrade your harpoon bolts, they will turn into fireballs that instantly kill 90% of the enemies because they set enemies on fire. That's it. Of course you can upgrade stock, health and stamina a couple of times, but not more. Besides, dynamic drop works in this game, just like in Resident Evil 4. It means that bullets, health, syringes and gel you find on the levels are not fixed. The game looks at what you have and generates sources you need more. If you don't have enough bullets, the game will give you bullets, for example. And even this way, it sometimes doesn't save you from dumb fights and lack of bullets. The point that I'm trying to say here is that the game won't leave you completely without resources. Upgrade HP? Not relevant, because almost everything in this game deals you too much damage and kills you instantly. Melee attacks? Well, if you like humiliation, pain and suffering, then yeah, you can upgrade that. But it's still useless. Speaking about genres again. This game is not a bad survival horror. 
Well, I mean it is, but first and foremost, the game is a really, really bad third-person shooter, and we'll see this moment clearly soon enough. This arena is just an omen about what's about to happen. Let's get back to the game. On this level we meet Lore for the first time. She's a boss and a very recognizable archetype called Ondrio, with pale skin and long black hair. Except she has another pair of hands. For the first time we don't have to fight her, we can just run away. And just look at this crap! The stairs are empty, I tried to use the sprint and my stamina ends exactly at the moment when Rubik appears. And all I can do is to look at his dick for 5 seconds while he's killing me with a Jedi shockwave. I can't find words to explain how bad it feels. Who created this stamina meter? How could I predict this situation? This game is all about tries and deaths, and this example is just tip of the iceberg. Then we fall on the wall. I know it sounds dumb, but this still happens. We meet a couple of invisible enemies, and this level actually saves the tension of the first level. The location itself is a bit boring, but you can't take away this awesome visual component that is present here, and a good work of enemies placement. I'm not even against invisible enemies here. I mean, ideologically I don't like them very much, but they work here pretty well. Everything is focused, coincised and measured here, and when a game feels comfortable with its instruments, it starts to shine. And that's a huge tragedy that after this level exactly, the evil within loses it unmercifully. We solved the easiest puzzle in history, and I cannot make up an excuse for this element besides designers and developers wanted to create a segment with spares so damn much. I mean, all you have to do is to find a symbol on the wall. At first I thought that there was supposed to be some kind of trick. I mean, it can't be that easy, I thought. But unfortunately I was wrong. I don't ask for super complicated puzzles in horror games, but I expected a bit more creativity here. Well, again, it's subjective, I get that. But this game is for mature players, not children from kindergarten. Come on. Sebastian finds Joseph, and this is literally the whole dialogue they have in this scene. Definitely not okay. You brought me here? <coughs> Jesus, what happened? My head feels like... Like... Do you hear that? We need to get out of here. Nothing like, oh my god, there are zombies everywhere. Just, eh, glad you're okay. Let's go. Let's go. Where are we going? I don't have a clue. Let's just go somewhere waiting for the floor to collapse again and teleport us where we need to be. And that's funny because this exact thing will happen 20 minutes later. Okay, I thought it couldn't get any worse, but now we have escort missions. Well, you know, our favorite escort missions we love in games. And at this moment when the game shows us how to heal Joseph, I laugh so hard at anyone who at least once tried to persuade me that the evil within is a serious survival horror. Strategic thinking and understandable plot, sure. Come on, you have a healing system from Gears of War. That's a shooter. I mean, why doesn't this action require our healing syringes? I'll tell you why. These episodes were made in order to artificially lengthen the whole game, and developers know it. They barely care about immersion or experience in general. All they have to do is to make this game last for 16 hours. This way they'll show that they're not some indie studio. What? You think that was made for some character development, their chemistry and emotional communication with a player? Yeah, this could be a perfect moment for that, if the scenario was written by people, not aliens. Right until this moment, Sebastian has been traveling on his own, and maybe he's not a character who likes to think out loud. And now, after finding Joseph, his partner, his sole support, maybe he'll slightly open up and show us some emotions, show us his sensibilities. Unfortunately, the scenario for this game was written by aliens, so nothing like this happens. Joseph, just like Leslie, is not a character here, he's a function, an instrument for level designers to put more arenas into this game. Joseph is an Asian guy, and we all know that Asians are good either at mathematics or kung fu. This Asian guy wears glasses, and I seriously doubt that he can fight. So, mathematics. Mathematics is all about counting and digits, so he specializes in digits on dialing units, bombs and all that stuff. 
In this part of the game, he opens doors with bombs and we have to shoot down all zombies in the neighborhood. To tell you the truth, I have no idea how it fits into an overall structure of a survival horror game. I mean this style in general where you have some arenas and you have to survive until time runs out. This is again more of a rule for shooters. Sometimes it can be used if a game wants you to hide. Think strategically, hide more and kill enemies one by one. By this time it's not the case because we're trapped in a room and more and more enemies try to kill us. And the only way to overcome this level is to throw your inventory at enemies and pray that at this moment we have things to throw. We'll return to this topic slightly later because Joseph has turned into a zombie! He's fine. What happened right now exactly? Uh, no, seriously, I want to know what that was. Previously, we saw the process of turning twice. It was Connolly, the driver of the ambulance car, and the citizens of the village on the first level. And now we see this process again, and this is the first time when it stopped for some reason and Joseph came back to normal. Sounds like a very intriguing and important detail. Um, what Joseph saw when he was turning into a zombie? Did he even realize it? What did he feel while turning? We should find out, we need to ask him because it can possibly give us some insight on the events of the game. Joseph, after Connolly, I thought, I don't know what came over me. <coughs> I haven't been feeling well, but... Look, let's just get out of here. There's something wrong with this place. Yeah. Okay, listen, I don't ask for descriptions and dialogues in Dostoevsky style, where the description of a simple oak can take 10 pages. I don't ask for a 2 hours long cutscene, where heroes explain every minimal possible hypothesis. But hell, I wait for any response, any reaction from anyone! In my opinion, the situation where your only partner in such circumstances suddenly turns into a zombie deserves at least some kind of reaction or analysis, don't you think? Otherwise, why is this scene here? What does this scene add to narration and the game if no one cares about it? Just imagine the saw where between traps characters didn't discuss or react to anything and kept repeating. I don't know what's happening here, we have to get out. No shit Sherlock, of course we need to get out if you wanna live. What do we need to get out? What should we do? Maybe we should dig up some information and find out how these traps work. Oh no, the exit must be right here. No? Well, okay. Kidman! Get me out of this thing! Wait a minute. It's another trap. Look. <laughs> It's basically the same arena like before, but this time it's way bigger. And on this level, the last bits of the illusion that this game is an atmospheric survival horror die. The first two levels, which were a bit awkward, at least tried to build up the whole philosophy of the game. About waiting, stealth, patience, the game of risks with five matches, it all goes out of the window here. Why? You mean besides the fact that this chapter is just a series of arenas with killing waves of monsters with mechanics that are not relevant here. You need reasons besides that. Okay, zombies with dynamite. And these are not just zombies with some dynamite stuck in their bellies, no. These are zombies that throw this dynamite at you and they keep throwing this dynamite at you until one of you dies. They have unlimited dynamite, oh yeah. That's so survival of you. Some random zombie can carry unlimited dynamite when I can carry only 5 matches. Wow, what an atmosphere. When the first phase of this battle ends, the game wakes up and reminds us that we actually tried to save Kidman from some kind of aquarium. I can't get the thing open. I think there's another control panel around here. We're running out of time. Where do these cables go? I'll go. Tell me what to do. 
suddenly the game gives us timer. So before this moment Kidman was not in danger, apparently. Now Sebastian has to run through another pack of zombies to a thing that could be a puzzle, and it probably was during some early phases of development. But you know, the game doesn't really want to have anything interesting in it, so Joseph simply tells us the answer. It's got the same kind of dials, right? Yeah, a top one and a bottom one. Set the upper dial to 22 and the lower dial to 5. Okay, Joseph. Come on, boy. How do you know that? I'm serious. I, I, I wanna know. Not only did you know that there were two dials, not one or three. There was a dial, not something else. But you also knew the correct combination. I want to know how. You realized it because it was an aquarium. Of course it's obvious, an aquarium equals two dials, easy peasy. Okay, whatever. We solved. The puzzle released Kidman and then, I'm completely serious right now, within the next 20 minutes, our characters will be separated by the breaking floor twice. And we, knowing that our companions can be too far, because we still have HP indicator of Joseph for some reason, find them pretty soon. And then the floor breaks up again. Okay, it doesn't actually break, but very skinny arms pull us down through the floor. You see, I didn't lie to you when I said that this game knew only one way of changing locations. Do you have any idea how such elements ruin immersion? You literally can't take seriously anything here, because you know that no matter what, no matter how well you've played, the floor may fall down any second, and you'll find yourself somewhere else. Why the hell did you need this scene with the floor if almost the exact same thing happens 15 minutes later, when our heroes get separated by another sudden deus ex machina? Just try to read some books about script writing. The more you use the same technique like and then the floor under the main hero suddenly broke down without any reason and he found himself in a completely different place, the less complete and connected your story sounds. Why couldn't they simply replace the first floor breaking with a phrase and then they went to the basement and then arms from the floor happened? Why couldn't they do that? Yeah, this way they would have to throw away some cool looking effects, and I wouldn't have to have a headache trying to guess the meaning of such transitions. I understand that this may be subjective, but let me get this straight. If the argument, otherwise they wouldn't show us some cool effects, works for you, okay, I can accept that. But in this case, let's ignore all problems of this game with so-called deep plot, atmosphere of a survival horror, and call it what it actually is, a barely working shooter with some cool effects. But no, a lot of people try to prove me wrong. Again, I have to remind you that we'll talk about the plot, but a bit later. And there is a reason for that. For now, I would like to point out one thing. The storytelling, I mean, the way this or that story presents its own plot, has the same value as the plot itself, maybe even more actually. One storyline, the sequence of events, has dozens of ways to be presented and told. And if the storytelling sucks, the whole experience sucks, no matter how interesting your universe can be. Here's a very simple example, a raw sequence of facts. A girl called Alice went to the kitchen and ate a sandwich. An extremely simple example. And as I've already told you, there are dozens of ways to roll the story into narration. And depending on how exactly a writer does that, even the genre can change. If a writer knows how narration works, this story can become a comedy, thriller, action and even horror if this writer wants to. Let's try to tell this story. It was a very nice day in Boston and a girl with the name Alice realized that she was hungry. She didn't really want to take her mind off her favorite book she was reading, but still she decided to go to the kitchen, make a sandwich and eat it. This is one of the most primitive ways to tell the story. We have a setting, introduction or the start, conflict, motivation and resolution. Very good. Here's another way to tell the story. It was a rainy and gloomy day, just like many other days in London. Alice didn't like the apartment her family moved to, especially the kitchen. But this apartment was the most appropriate variant, since they were not so rich. Sometimes when Alice enters the kitchen for a second, it seems like all shiny items in the kitchen sparkle red. They say that the young lady who used to live in this apartment before really liked this color. It seemed like uncontrollable gluttony had stuck to every inch in the room, devouring and making everyone who enters the room eat until they die. This is more of a horror style. 
And here's the same storyline in the Evil Within style. Alice wanted a sandwich and went to a bar, and then she was taken to a hen house, and then fell into a bath. Nick offered his help, he was captured by a giant bat. Alice went through the door again, climbed a huge flower, but it was late, she had to return. Water in the kettle was boiling, the model of this kettle was 445783 by the way. Then Alice took a sandwich, but it wasn't a sandwich, it was some bullsh**. The end. This is nonsense, a word salad that's written by some lunatic with sparks and fire, but it doesn't make sense. There are statues with keys in this game. We need these keys to open safes in our hub with some bullets, health syringes or gel. The idea itself is absolutely okay, but why statues exactly? Why not some simple sparkling keys? It looks ridiculous. Why is there a statue on the crowd? I mean, I could try to find some deep symbolism here, but there's a statue on the crowd for God's sake! I mean, I already told you about the fullness of perception, immersion and atmosphere, but there's a statue on the flying crowd! And a rat! Why does it have to be a crowd? Okay, this could be a simple mistake. Maybe at some point developers wanted it to be some collectibles, for example. But after that, made up this idea about saves in our hub. It would look more reasonable if it was a key tied to the crowd's foot. Maybe at some point the guy who was responsible for these collectibles just quit and the rest of the team tried to do something about it. Or maybe some people actually thought that there was a good idea to use these statues. Come on, we're Japanese, these dumb gaijin don't understand a thing about game development. Okay. After that we meet Laura again. That spider woman from before, with one attack that kills you instantly. But this time we have to fight her one on one. And this fight would be a problem if her AI wasn't so bad. Bullets don't seem to damage her, but fire seems to work. So we have to allure her near those red barrels with gasoline or something like that and set her on fire. And she dies quite easily. In general, this is not a bad boss fight. At least she has one unique feature with the fire. It would be great though if the game could somehow telegraph us whether we harm Laura or not. I mean, you cannot kill her here with a gun. But earlier when we had to run away from her, you actually could kill her with a gun. It was extremely difficult to do, but nevertheless. I mean, she dropped the gel and all that, but here you cannot kill her with a gun. Besides, it's natural to think here that maybe fire just slows her down and pisses her off, and we just wait a bit to lock her in a special room, for example. If I could see that some parts of her body fall off, or fry, or she moves differently, it would be easier to understand that fire can really kill her. Besides here, right until the very end, you're not sure whether fire kills her bit by bit or is just a way to distract her in order to find or do something else. Besides, camera does not help here at all. Look at this, I climb up to pull the lever. And I'm not sure if Laura is in the room or not. I pull the lever and hope that she is still here. This problem could be solved so easily. Just make the camera take a general scene here so players could see both Sebastian and the room. I mean, we could see this approach several times in the game before. Why just... Eh. Another evidence that the game was probably released earlier than planned. And yeah, again, reality f***s up and we find ourselves in... Majula? We look through the houses around and find Joseph. Again. It's like the third time we find Joseph, right? And here some trash happens. The sixth chapter is one of the worst levels in this game. And this game is full of awful levels, so it definitely says a lot. Well. First of all, zombies with Molotov cocktails appear here. Freaking zombies with Molotov cocktails. Where did they get those cocktails? How do they know how they work and how to create them? Can you imagine zombies somewhere in the kitchen with bottles, gasoline and cloths? If they understand how Molotov and fire work, why do they use them? I mean, those zombies burn way easier and better than Sebastian, so it's more dangerous for them than for me. This whole segment sucks. Again, doors that Joseph has to unlock and Sebastian has to kill waves of enemies. And it's the worst arena in this game because it's small and tight. There is nowhere to maneuver here. All you can do is to run in circles and throw your inventory away until Joseph finally opens that door. If you're lucky enough and you have a lot of flash bolts at this moment, it's easier to walk through this segment. Flash bolts are pretty ultimate weapon against ordinary zombies, actually. Because when enemies are blinded, you can instantly kill enemies with your stealth attack without being in stealth. But after Joseph deals with this door, we have another one. Where again we have to wait until Joseph opens this one, and again we have to kill waves of zombies and run in circles. 
And that's all we can do this time, because if we had ammo in the previous section, we used it almost completely. And even if your inventory health empty here, you will die. Die many times. Someone can say something like, well, maybe it's a challenge. No, it's not. Because challenge in video games checks some skill or knowledge of a player. And we had an example for that, the part with Laura. The game was checking our knowledge about her fire vulnerability. In a very controlled environment, the game showed that to us. The boss fight in general is performed not perfectly well, but at least this knowledge check worked there. Let's get back to chapter 6. What knowledge does this level check? Perhaps if you shoot at zombies it will die? What skill does it test? To run in circles, aim at zombies' heads in such a small room? Seriously? But I'll tell you what it checks. It checks your ability to keep your inventory full of stuff. Do you have flash bolts and pockets full of ammo? If you do, that's fine. If you don't, then this segment turns into a boring jerk-off. Even if you do have pockets full of ammo and flash bolts, it's still a boring jerk-off, but at least it doesn't kill you. No matter how you look at this segment, it's just a poor game design, and it's not how shooters work. By the way, at this point we can completely bail on the fantasies that this game is an atmospheric survival horror and accept that this is a third-person shooter. And again, camera here sucks for this kind of gameplay and genre beyond the pale. Your field of view while shooting is extremely narrow, and most of the time when you receive damage is when someone jumps on you from blind zone. Such a great game design formula, don't you think? The main skill is to collect ammo, the main challenge is a shitty camera. At this point, I sincerely believe that players had to have a chance to exchange gel for bullets. It would actually fit in perfectly well here, just think about it. Absence of bullets adds the element of suspense here. Something that adds anxiety in an extremely dangerous environment. Bullets in horror games are often a game of risk. You have two bullets and two enemies. They can't see me, but I can see them. I use one bullet and kill one enemy for sure and try to kill another enemy with my last bullet. It's risky, I can miss and I have to run and risk my life in this case instead. I may not take the risk and try to go stealth here, maybe I'll be able to use environment around me somehow. Plethora of games use such an approach and even The Evil Within in rare cases tries to do the same. And all of this is just an illusion because the only actually working strategy for almost any situation in the game is to shoot everything you see and collect everything you can. Because stealth is fundamentally broken, environment and traps are broken too, as a rule there is nowhere to run. All these flaws make my attempts to use stealth look absurd. Yes, it somehow worked in the first two levels because we had space for that and the game took that style of gameplay into account. But this... these arenas of 6 square meters with spawning waves of enemies... Here, bullets is not the game of risk, it's a necessary instrument, so the opportunity to buy bullets would fit here perfectly in my opinion. This opportunity would actually add some depth to the gameplay in general. Just think about it. The bullets would cost the same green gel as the upgrades. So should I make my life easier now? Or should I save up my resources and make my life easier in long perspective? But no, till the very end the game pretends to be a survival horror. Yes, I've already mentioned dynamic drop in this game, but it doesn't mean that the amount of resources is decent. The next location is finally not some 6 square meters arena with NPCs. This one is a huge arena with NPCs. And, well, if you don't know what to do here, this arena has a potential to be one of the worst experiences in the game. The number of enemies is outrageous here. There's almost no option to escape direct encounter with them. So you'll run out of bullets very fast, keeping in mind the previous levels. Some levers can be found on the level, and at first you think that this is the way you have to go, but no, there are even more enemies there. What you need to do is to kill four enemies over there, and then the door will open. How should we have guessed that? Well, this is a third-person shooter, so why not kill enemies over there? Besides, here for the first time we find a sniper rifle. What's ridiculous here is the behavior of Joseph. He's simply useless here. But if you shoot a lightning bolt at him, he'll turn into a walking Tesla gun. I'm not sure whether it was intended, but I laughed so hard when I saw that for the first time. After that, the fight with another boss starts. You know, bosses have been the most interesting part of the game up until this moment. They have some unique and interesting design. And how do you think, what kind of original and interesting boss will be presented to players after one of the most intense sequences in the game? Um, sadist. Again. The same boss we killed once and saw twice. Wow. It's the same boss fight, throw everything you have at him, but I would like to pay attention to one moment here. Last time we didn't take his chainsaw because presumably it turned dull and broke because of the huge chain. That's what chainsaws and chains do, you know. But this time, 
he has another chainsaw. And this time we don't take this chainsaw because fuck you. I don't need any chainsaw, it's big and awkward, I want some electroshock in my brain. Speaking about details, here is a cutscene where Joseph is being carried to guillotine, and I have no idea why zombies are doing this right now. Why are they not eating his brains right now? I mean, in the whole game. These exact specific zombies turned out to be gourmet. We have to shoot them using our sniper rifle, right? And here's the distance their zombies have to go to reach guillotine. I want you to guess at what moment the game will decide that we have failed and the cutscene of execution will start. Uh, I think somewhere, somewhere here, I mean somewhere here sounds right and makes sense. Actually no, it's here. This is just a piece of a sloppy work. I really don't understand why it is here. Half of the way was there. Another arena while Joseph is opening the door. And it's not even right to call this place an arena because we can't even move here properly. The level changes and we stumble upon a dialogue between Sebastian and Joseph. Right now you should understand one thing about this game. I've mostly been describing you the mechanics of this game, gameplay, game design, levels and all that. I haven't touched the plot almost at all. So if you at this point have absolutely no idea what's happening here in terms of the story, that's normal and fine, I'm serious right now. I know what you feel. More than that, I understand you better than you think. Because this is literally the way game itself reveals its plot. At this point, a player who plays this game for the first time will be in the same condition as you now. This is the sixth chapter, it's close to the middle of the game. And after all this time, wandering in the catacombs, villages, hospitals, the plot hasn't moved even a bit. The plot decided to stand still at the moment where we found Connolly in the beginning of the game. Up until this moment, we haven't found out absolutely nothing new. Neither about the world, nor characters, nor about what's happening around here, and what we need to do in order to get out of here. Zero new information has been offered to a player until this very moment. I mean besides meetings with some other heroes like Rivik, Leslie and Jimenez, but their names are everything we actually know about them. I'm not even exaggerating right now, even after reading all notes in the game, we still have no idea what's happening here. And this dialogue is the first freaking dialogue in this goddamn game where our heroes have a chance to take a break and just talk. Let's take a look. <coughs> Is this what it was like, Seb? After the accident? Well, I never put a gun to my head. No, of course not. Just quietly sank into a bottle. We can't all be perfect. It never affected my work. But hey, you read the IA report. You know I didn't report you because I was worried about your work, Sebastian. <sighs> Okay, in this scene we find out that Sebastian had some problems with alcohol after some accident. Okay, but he doesn't look like an alcoholic and besides the whole game hasn't made such an impression at all. I mean, I look at him and I don't see the archetype of an alcoholic cop. Well, okay, what happened to him? What tragedy happened to him? How bad is his problem with alcohol? Obviously, not that bad, so it would affect his work and ability to shoot properly. Is it even alcoholism? Uh, but whatever, what's next? Maybe we'll know about it in the dialogue. We don't have time for this. Oh, you son of a bitch. Of course, of course you don't have time for this. Because it's the first time the game possesses opportunity, time and wish to add some character development and it instantly gets scared and throws that idea away. At this point here, what do we know about our heroes? Joseph turned into a zombie once, but then came back to normal. Sebastian is an alcoholic and apparently it concerns Joseph so much, he actually touched this theme here. Besides, Sebastian had some tragedy or accident in the past that led him to be an alcoholic. Hmm, I'm interested how the game will develop these things. Where will these facts lead us to? What meaning do these events have for our current situation? Are you ready, children? The game does not raise these themes or even mention them ever again. The game completely throws these plot lines away. Sebastian is an alcoholic? No one will mention it again. This information does not influence anything. 
But the most disappointing fact is that scene with Joseph, when he became zombie. Come on, this one has to. No, it must lead somewhere, seriously. Maybe Joseph will turn into a monster in the end and we'll have to fight him, although he was our partner. Oh no, it's so hard to be in a zombie drama. But hey, that would be so trivial. Perhaps this game has something great ideas for this plotline, hey? Oh yeah? Maybe it has f***ing nothing for this plotline. I'm not kidding. Up to that, Joseph will turn into a zombie one more time for half of a minute, and nothing like this will ever happen again. And our heroes will not discuss or react to this in any possible way, except one mentioning closer to the end of the game, when it doesn't even mean anything. Have you been having any nosebleeds? Headaches? No. Why? Joseph was. It's like he was turning into one of those... things. Maybe it doesn't affect everybody. Seriously, almost half of the game has passed between the scene with Joseph turning into a zombie and the scene with Kidman. It's the 12th or 13th chapter, I don't remember right now. And we don't have any development of this conflict. Our heroes just forget about it like nothing happened. How is this possible? How could a living man write this, look at it and say, Yeah, this is a great scenario. It, it totally fits our expensive AAA horror game. I'm a real scriptwriter and know how to write and letters and all that stuff. And don't tell me about letters, notes and audio files. Not a single line in those notes explains what is happening to Joseph. I mean, yeah, they tell the story of Sebastian, but don't you think it's a problem when in such a big game that pretends to be so cinematic, the only identifying feature is not only described in notes, that I hope will be read by half of the players, but also has no value in the context of the story that is told here. To tell you the truth, I don't like when a part or some parts of the plot are described for the notes like in Quantum Break or Rise of the Tomb Raider. You shoot, roll, jump, run, the blood is pumping in our ears, the flow is perfect. And you have to stop for like 3 minutes to read some notes that may be not even relevant to the story. And speaking about the evil within, the fact that Sebastian's daughter died in the fire and his wife detective got lost while investigating this accident does not refer to the story by all means. Again, I have to remind you that we're pretending that there is no second part, for some time at least. Because first of all, the story in this game should be complete. And second, I seriously doubt that it was actually planned to release the second part at all. This story about Sebastian's wife and daughter could be cut out completely and nothing would change in terms of the story. What I found. Seems to be in working condition. Go on ahead, I'll cover you. Oh yeah? You'll cover me? Thank you for covering me, you jerk. We meet, eh, well, let's say another boss, but in general it's the same sadist, because the way of killing is completely the same. Throw you inventory and run. Now we're in catacombs under the church, and it's almost the only time where we got through, you know, some kind of passage. Wow, easy there game. I understand that it may be tough to go beyond your zone of comfort, but maybe that's too much. Maybe it's better to add a scene of coming to consciousness. Uh, yep, yep, there we go, that's better. We find an extremely strange puzzle in my opinion. Four tables and sacks above those tablets. We have to lift several of them and drop some of them down according to the instructions on the wall. If we do everything right, we shall not be pierced by huge pikes or something like that. And I personally, just like previous ones, cannot call it a puzzle. I mean, the answer is literally written on the wall. Wait, wait, wait a second, are there people in those sacks? I mean, there are probably people there. It's some kind of a torture room here. How can Sebastian be sure that there are zombies in those sacks? We met several real people in this game already. Why can't he just untie them and check? He's a police officer, for God's sake! Oh, hi, doggy. But it looks like... Mm, like if in a dog there was another dog. By the way, guys, don't buy your pets shitty food. First you feed it to them, and then you're surprised why your pet looks like a boss from Bloodborne. Just like many other boss fights in this game, this one is awkward and overlong. The tactics is the same, run around and throw your inventory at him. But this time the process is a little bit different. The doggy hides in bushes around and you have to track her down. Moving branches show you where the dog is. Besides the strategy, of course, again you have to use uh, lightning, flash or freezing bolts and guns of damage. This strategy, by the way, works for majority of enemies here, including bosses. First you shoot a lightning bolt or a freezing one, and then shoot from a pistol or shotgun, something like that. After the stun is over, repeated that over and over again. This way fight with bosses becomes rather easy, if you ask me. I still wonder why this dog is not eating Joseph so politely while he's lying there unconscious. 
Okay, we killed the dog, and exactly at this moment, Joseph regains consciousness. How convenient, isn't it? Thank you for covering me, Joseph, by the way. We move behind the fence to a new location, and that's it. Nothing else happens. Nothing at all. Not a single super dumb stupidity happens here. Well, except this scene. What is it? I dropped my glasses back there. Fuck. No way, Joseph. No, f you, I'm not going back there. Did you see that dog? That presumably was killed a minute ago. Are you freaking blind or what? I dropped my glasses back there. Oh. Yeah, exactly. The only thing I like here is this sense of despair because no one asks you whether you want to go there or not. You must go there because Joseph told you so. Again, no reactions, no arguments, no comments, nothing. Okay, face, you heard the guy, we have to do this. Maybe I would not be so angry about this scene if the game had shown us before how much Joseph needs his glasses. Seriously, maybe he's completely blind without them. Because according to the information that was given in the game, I don't know anything about his glasses. Maybe he doesn't have any dioptric there. And he just, I don't know, wears them to feel normal or some bullshit like that. I'm sorry. It's not just about being unable to see. It's about... Feeling normal. You ever had the urge to just jump? When you're on a high place? <coughs> and then Ruvik appears and throws us to another level. Again. And I'm seriously getting tired of this again. This following level with catacombs could be cut out completely, and nothing would actually change. All you have to do here is to wander around for like 15 minutes and nothing interesting happens. Well, Keeper appears, but we'll talk about it later. But even here we see that he's super dumb and does not even constitute a threat. Because just look at this setup. There are traps on the floor and spikes above us. Everything Keeper had to do was to cover the whole floor completely with those traps, not just randomly throw like 10 of them there. Easy peasy. The Evil Within is a very cinematic experience, and you know, some dumb decisions are quite accurate for the genre. And we find Leslie again. Y yay! But he instantly runs away for parts unknown, and we don't see him for... like, three hours? Why couldn't we find him later? Seriously, pacing would be so much more reasonable. What's the point for one of the main characters to appear for 10 minutes where he does nothing Oh, wait, actually he does. He's needed in this scene in order to activate a trap like a retard and lock Sebastian in the room. This way or another, this is the time where we meet Keeper for real and he's the mascot of the game. Even if you didn't play this game, you probably heard about this one. He was on every piece of marketing. He's a dude with a safe instead of his head. He wears an apron and has a big sack and hammer as weapons. This design is really interesting. Mm, if you ask me, looks familiar in a way, don't you think? A big man with some grotesque thing on his head or instead of his head. Where could I see this design? God damn it, I cannot remember. Maybe, you know, write in the comment section if you know that. He's rather slow, but he can return to life using the saves on the level. By the way, you can start to bet money on how many times we'll be fighting him. I mean, they've reused two first bosses twice by this time. By this time. <laughs> it's important. And on the one hand, I can understand the attempts to make him, like, the key enemy, sex symbol of the game, like, you know who from you know where. But the problem is, you know who you know where was the absolute threat. You couldn't even scratch him most of the time. When you saw him, you could only escape. That was your only option, and that's why it worked. He was the manifestation of anxiety, danger, and torment of the main character. Here, Keeper dies from two shots of a sniper rifle. The gun isn't even upgraded. Yes, he comes back to life all the time, but it's not the same. This is not an unbeatable threat. It's very beatable, but it takes time and resources. It annoys more than scares. But nevertheless, I should give proper respect. The game tries very hard. For example, when it revives, you can see the kind of effect or filter that adds some individuality to this enemy. The problem is how the game does not work on this image. You can even forget about the similar looking design. Come on, it's been 17 years already. I think it's fine if Tango Games can take inspiration from other resources. I'm not dumb. 
Because if the game were a survival horror in the mood of the first two levels, Keeper would work much better. An inescapable enemy who puts traps all over the place, doesn't actually die and is actually a rather tyrannical figure. That would work out very well. But the problem is that this game is not a survival horror, so all segments with Keeper are played a little bit ridiculous. I mean, we've recently killed a dog with two heads and burned down Spider Woman, so some guy with a sack doesn't actually scare human with a safe instead of his head. But yeah, this first fight with him is not that bad in spite of that running around and throwing your inventory at your enemies. This time we have to turn wells and preferably not to die there. Yeah, still it looks like running around and I'm a bit disappointed that we can't catch Keeper into a trap or control this fight one way or another. This fight, in my opinion, is the perfect place to add environment and interactivity. Yeah, we can use some bullets, but there is no point in doing so, if you ask me. But the final scene is really funny. Keeper exposes our master plan with turning valves and destroys the final one. Come on, man, all you need to do is to hit this valve one more time to break the core and this game will be over. And of course another valve is lying on the table right in the beginning of the location. And that was super obvious, but we couldn't take it right away. The only thing that this scene does for me is frustration. Because if you die here, you simply can't take this valve with you. As I've already said, you see it in the beginning of the segment, but Sebastian refuses to take it. Here it is, take it, take it, you'll need that in future, I promise. But again, it's not lethal, it just irritates a little. And after that we... Kill him? Sebastian, are you blind? You cannot kill him, he'll just revive from another save, or not? Is he out of saves? I definitely saw other saves on the level. Again, the following level could be cut out completely, and this would not only not harm the game, it would make it better. Another trivial labyrinth in a cave where nothing interesting happens. We see here new types of zombies with two heads. Nothing special besides the fact that one of their attacks instantly kills you and these enemies were taken from Resident Evil 5. But the most important thing is that you can't kill them from stealth. Why? Seriously, why? Because they have two heads? Besides, the game does not actually show it to you. You can try to do it, because, you know, you could do that all the time up until this moment. You fail, you're fucked, and you're not sure whether it's another problem of the game or you suddenly realize that your hands grow out of your ass. I don't know. You may think that I tried to skip content or something like that, but no, on this level literally nothing happens. There is one audio log here that doesn't give us any valuable information and one note that makes me ask questions. In the end of this cave we find a corpse and a note next to him. From this note we learn that the guy was trapped here as well and reached this door. And there is a puzzle on the door. We should put a tablet into the door and if we do it right the door will open. And if you don't, you die. And again, you can't call it a puzzle because the answer is literally written on the tablet. There is blood on one side of the tablet and no blood on the other one. Hmm, what should I do in order not to die? I don't know, too complicated, guys. It's rated M for mature, by the way, if you forgot. The whole level seems like out of place here. It would fit to a game like Tomb Raider or Uncharted with all those arrows and traps, with the guy who even calls the name of his wife in the note. This is more character development than some real characters in this game, really. I have a hypothesis that this game was supposed to be more valuable, and this dead guy was supposed to have some kind of role here, with puzzles and quests. And maybe someone ran out of money or desire or inspiration and this level turned into a boring linear level with one puzzle in the end. And as a fact, you can describe a lot of levels here like that. In the perfect world, every enemy, every phase and in general everything we see in a video game, movie or book should give us some kind of information about environment, rules of the world, characters, mechanics, plot, anything. If this or that element does not do that, why the hell is this or that specific element is in the game at all? What does this add to the story and experience? You know, I'm tired of all these levels, caves, traps, catacombs. I think it misses something. Maybe we should add hospital here. You know, with wheelchairs and all that. Wheelchairs are so scary, right? Nice idea, don't you think? But there is a problem. We're in catacombs now. How should we write our script in order to move Sebastian there? Oh wait, it's the evil within. At moments like these, I really start to think. Do we really need to go anywhere? I mean, these random transitions were not connected with our actions by all means. So why can't just Sebastian sit down and wait until something happens? The game doesn't give us any trigger, destination, motivation or something like that. 
That's what I would do if I were him and knew that my actions would not make any sense. And finally, at this point, we find the plot. And this is the first piece of plot we find. I'm not kidding, this is the first time. The plot at least somehow unravels before us. All this time the game tried to scare us with gore and tried to be a shooter. And this is the time where we'll start talking about extremely deep plot of the evil within. Wait, what? what's happening? The, the floor! The, it's moving! Oh, no! I'm okay, I'm, I'm fine. I just need to get out of here somehow. It may take some time, so... I'll see, I'll see you as soon as, as I get, get out of here. here. Thank, Thank you for, you your, for your attention and patience, patience, ladies and gents. gents. I, hope I hope you liked like this video. video. Let, Let me know if you did. did. Leave a Leave like, comment, comment, and subscribe, because, because why the hell not? not. Thank, Thank you for, for your time, time and patience. patience. Love, Love you. you.